for me. For me. For me. A big win for humanity was the discovery of electromagnetism. The use of family planning. The creation of the world's first successful vaccine by Dr. Edward Chena. The fact that we have a woman vice president in the United States. The eradication of smallpox was one of the biggest wins for humanity. Achieving this was not easy. But making history never is. Together we rose to the challenge. We have the chance to achieve another big win. The eradication. The eradication. The eradication of polio. It won't be easy. We have the tools. We have the knowledge. The know-how and the blueprint. To ensure no child is paralyzed by polio again. Eliminar de vez a poliomielite é um esforço global, urgente e necessário. So show your support today. Donate. Advocate. Raise awareness. Be engaged. Together? Together. 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 We can do this. Let's make history again. And end polio. And polio. Eradicate polio. End polio. And end polio today. and join us in the conversation tonight. Before we really get started, we want to make sure that everyone knows that the Gates Foundation stands on the traditional lands of the Duwamish and the Coast Salish peoples. They have been here since time immemorial. We are grateful to be guests living and learning on their land. We recognize that this land continues to be their home and that they are alive and strong. Our land acknowledgement does not replace, however, the continued effort to build relationships and to give back to the Duwamish and Coast Salish peoples. If you're not familiar with land acknowledgements, you can learn more about them in the chat, and we invite you to learn about whose land that you might be on and how you can take action. So I'm going to start real quickly with uh, just a, an overview of polio, um, a disease that has been with us, well, since time immemorial. We think of it as a more of a 50s disease that appeared in America. But as we know from ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics, there were princes that had shriveled legs in some of the hieroglyphics that show that this, this disease has been with humanity for a very long time. There's so many thanks to be given. And I could probably spend the rest of our time just talking about all the incredible efforts that have been made globally for years to eradicate polio. First of all, we want to thank the Rotary International people for their tireless work and their advocacy to end polio. You know, it was Rotary that first decided they could take on this, this job. And they bravely set forth to, to do just that, starting with the Philippines and then on to other places in the world. And then they were joined by some very powerful partners who saw that they, what they were doing and wanted to be part of it. We're talking about UNICEF, the World Health Organization, and the Centers for De Disease Control. And together, they formed the largest global health initiative the planet has ever seen, ever seen. Then along came the Gates Foundation, no small player at all. And they set up a, a wonderful and incredibly generous matching program with Rotary International to the tunes of hundreds of millions of dollars. And we want to thank every single one of those entities for their continued devotion to making our world polio free. So now I want to introduce these two fabulous people who are sitting with me. I'm gonna start down on the end with Tanayat Khan. A lot of you here at the Gates Foundation already know who she is. She's a very passionate advocate for the end of polio. And she's dedicated to eradicating it from the entire face of the planet. She spent many years strengthening and getting health vaccination systems in Pakistan. And Taniyat brings a unique perspective and deep commitment to her work as part of the Polio Eradication Initiative 
at the Gates Foundation, where she now works primarily in Afghanistan to er eradicate polio. So please welcome Teniat Khan. And immediately to my left, Ezra Tashome. Um, Ezra, I call him my brother. I think we have different mothers, but we're definitely soul mates for sure. Um, Ezra, uh, it's really hard to describe what all Ezra has done in the fight to eradicate polio. Um, it started in his homeland of Ethiopia. Back in what year did you first go, Ezra? In 97. Uh, by 2002, I, I joined his yearly uh, rotary missions to Ethiopia to vaccinate children. And from then it's just grown to his global work around the world. He's very committed. He's been named a Time Magazine Global Health Hero. And he's played a crucial role in the connection here between Rotary and the Gates Foundation. Uh, Ezra, you are, you're inspiring, you're uh, tireless. And um, I know that our audiences here and all around the world are going to have um, a really fun time getting to know you two a little bit better tonight. So I'm going to start with you, Ezra, as you know, I probably would. And um, 1997, you um, you grew up in Ethiopia. You ended up coming to the United States to be educated here. And then the dirge happened and you couldn't return home. Um, and you immigrated and uh, got asylum here in the United States. So you could have just easily assimilated into um, U.S. life. And um, you've been a, a very um, uh, profitable, you had a profitable life, a good life. Why did you why did you feel compelled to go back to Ethiopia to vaccinate children against polio? What 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 made your heart go back? Thank you, Penny. Can you hear me in the back? Uh, first, I want to thank the Gates Foundation. The staff has been tremendous to put this together. So I want to recognize all the support they have given us. Uh, in 1997, when I was president of my university district Rotary Club, there was a peace conference in Ethiopia that was arranged by Rotary International. So I was excited to go back as a Rotarian to meet some of the Rotarians in Ethiopia and uh, really learn about the work that they do. Although I've seen Growing up, I've seen people who've been affected by polio, but none of my relatives or family were uh, affected. But what really moved me was when the Rotarians arranged for us to go and vaccinate children. Uh, it was a group of us that went to this village. There was a, a father holding his daughter he thought we were there to cure his daughter. She was, she was affected by polio, about the same age as my daughter, and lifeless, stick-like legs. And the guy came to me and said, sir, here, here's my daughter. Can you help her? And it shocked me. It shocked me to the point where I said, you know, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't do anything. And I wasn't really familiar with what, what what polio does and but I saw the pain in his eyes and the more I learned about polio that girl was paralyzed for paralyzed for the lack of those two drops and I said my goodness if this is what it takes I will come back not only myself but I will bring my Rotarian family from the United States and Canada to go back and make sure nobody's daughter would have uh, the opportunity not to walk safely for the lack of those two drops. So from that time on, I was able to take 60 to 80 people with me to Ethiopia, Uganda, and Kenya to make sure that we go out and reach out every child and put those two drops in their mouths. So that's what Got That's me. where it started. We'll talk more about what those experiences are like on the ground in these places where we vaccinated. And I want to go to, to you, Tanya, right now, too, to talk about Afghanistan. Afghanistan and um, Pakistan are the two 
sole countries, the two remaining countries that where wild polio virus is still circulating. First of all, explain what that means to people who may not understand about wild polio virus and uh, where we started back in the 50s and 60s and where we are now. So give us a little bit of a primer about, about where we are. Right, thank you, Penny. That's a, a really great prompt. Um, and it's, it's hard to understate how far we've come in this fight against polio. I think back in 1988, it was, as you said, when the Global Polio Eradication Initiative uh, first came in, first formed, that the, really the fight against polio started. Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Hello? Okay, now it's on? Great. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, and, and since then, there's been incredible progress. Since 1988, about 125 countries have eradicated polio. Uh, back in 1988, there were three types of strains of polio, of wild polio virus, like you said. Um, and in terminology, we call them WPV1 and 2 and 3. Um, back in 2015, the GPI was successful in eradicating uh, WPV1 uh, followed closely by WPV, uh, sorry, WPV2 and followed closely by WPV3 in 2019. And now over the course of so many years, we eradicated in India, we eradicated in Nigeria. And now WPV1 is just cornered in two places in Pakistan and Afghanistan. And even there, we know it's not in the entire country. We know exactly where it is. It's in these very small pockets of population, we know where the communities are. We know what their issues are. And uh, the GPI, I feel, is very well equipped to really wipe off polio from the face of this earth. So it's been a long and incredible journey. And I hope we're at the tail end of it at, at this point. We have changed the approach so many times to fighting polio. We had uh, the sugar cubes when I was a, a girl that was, uh, that was uh, given the oral polio vaccine. But before that, it was a a vaccine, a, a, a shot, an inoculation. And the fact that we can now just use a liquid vaccine, the two drops, as Ezra was saying, to put in a child's mouth, mean it's been so much easier to distribute the vaccine with lay people like us. We don't have to be a trained medical personal person to be able to, to give the polio vaccine. So that's been a huge innovation with Sabin oral vaccine. Um, and then there's so much to learn too, as you said, the three strains of polio. Polio two has been completely eradicated, right? Long time ago. Is it just one in three that are still circulating or are we down to just one? It's just one. Just number one, which is the most virulent, as I understand, the most resistant of all of them, it the toughest seem one. so, yes. Yeah. So how many cases have we had in, uh, in Afghanistan and also uh, Pakistan? Like just a handful, right? Less than a dozen. Less this than year a dozen. there's just been 10 children that are paralyzed. Now, compare that to, was it 1988? It was, or there were 125 countries with 300, over 300,000 cases of polio. So look at how far we've come. Look how much there is to celebrate. Um, we're not there yet. And as long as one case of polio still exists, it can still break free and reinfect. Is that correct, Tenya? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think you captured it really well. Um, and there's, it, it, it's actually really interesting to see. It's a very resilient virus and it thrives on under immunized communities. So really until we can truly eradicate polio from everywhere, um, we will need to be very vigilant as a community, as a global community to maintain on top of our vaccinations, to make sure we are vaccinated and protected. I think it's, it's not even too long ago, I think just last year when we saw polio in places in the world that hadn't seen it for decades, right? Polio was detected in the US, in the UK, in Canada, um, precisely because those communities were under immunized. Um, and, and so I agree, even though wild polio virus is there only in a few pockets in the world left, yeah. um, there's a huge responsibility to finish this commitment to truly eradicate uh, so that really no child anywhere is at risk anymore. Okay, so let me follow up with that. What are you doing in Afghanistan and Pakistan to get rid of this nasty thing once and for all? What are you doing now with it? 
Oh, it's a good question. It's a big question. <laughs> what any new approaches? Any new uh, ways to to tackle this now? Yes, absolutely. And and this is something that really strikes me about the GPEI, the Eradication Initiative. It's a it's a big initiative that's been around for more than thirty years, and yet every time in every geography for every population, it's very nimble. It's very creative. It keeps coming up with new ways of tackling old problems. Um, some of some of the strategies we have are tried and tested. We know they work. You know, the polio vaccine drops work. Vaccinating children is very effective. Um, but how we reach each one of those children, each one of those population can be different. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, that means literally making sure vaccinators can reach populations. Um, sometimes these populations, these people are, live on top of mountains or in deserts or you know, to vaccinate 20 people, you have to travel three or four hours. Mm -hmm. So in some parts of Pakistan, we've had to equip vaccinators just with motorcycles so they can go faster and further and really reach those children. Mm -hmm. um, in some parts of uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan, there's a lot of uh, refusals and vaccine misinformation. And there we've worked closely with our partners to come up with new strategies of uh, addressing those concerns, addressing refusals, addressing misinformation, and better equipping parents to take those medical decisions for their children. Right. Um, and then, of course, we have all the technology tools of, um, you know, things like a new vaccine, which is a lot more effective. We have mobile money payments in different parts of Africa. Um, something that's really new and exciting and very close to my heart is uh, part of the new strategy, which is looking at gender as a lens. Um, to vaccinate more effectively. So there's there's a lot of new things in in this current approach in Pakistan and Afghanistan. I want to talk with you more about that um, in just a moment. I want to, as we're talking about techniques of vaccination, Ezra, <laughs> when I hear a motorcycle, I have to say, Ezra and I were fo following a motorcycle one time in some place in, where, where were you, Ezra? Somewhere in Ethiopia. <laughs> we got hopelessly lost trying to find the vaccination site because every time we went back, and I just will say, I, I started traveling with Ezra in 2002 uh, to do stories. I went a reporter and um, and followed this incredible team of Rotarians and other healthcare uh, givers in Ethiopia uh, as they walked, in many cases, door to door, hut to hut, uh, down dusty roads, um, all kinds of heat, you know, threats of malaria, wild animals. No, there weren't wild animals, but Ezra did hit a sheep one time and had to pay the farmer for it. So we, we have lots of stories. But um, so Ezra, the techniques in, in Ethiopia in particular were mostly trying to get door to door and then also a central vaccination site, right? Where people would come knowing on a vaccination day, they could bring their children there. The the advantage that we provide to the health workers is the attraction when children see uh, in an area where they have never seen a white person, everybody just uh, brings their brother or sister carrying them on their shoulders. So we, we attract a lot of children to chase us and also be ready to give the drop. I've, I've also followed some of the nomads who, who go from one place to another. So they have the camels. So the vaccinators would give the children the uh, vaccination and right on the camel that uh, the, that family, that child has been vaccinated wow. right on. The That's camel. how they kept track of who was vaccinated <laughs> in that family. So, yeah. Oh, it's wild. So it's, it's a really, uh, we bring quite a lot of uh, impact to the community. So whether it's in, in a, Central Health Clinic or door to door, our involvement has really helped to vaccinate numerous, numerous children. Mm -hmm. In every region we we visited, a little bit different approach was necessary, depending on um, how friendly the villagers were to us coming in with vaccines. You know, there's a lot of fear about vaccines and suspicions. Um, I want to introduce um, a very special person in the audience right now, and so we're going to need to bring a microphone up if we could. Um, Denny Wilford uh, is here in the front row, and Denny is a member of the Gig Harbor Rotary Club, and um, Denny has traveled with us. Um, do, you, do you remember the first year, Denny, you went to? In 2005. And um, as a polio survivor, he has a very personal story about what drew him 
to to come to Ethiopia with us. So are you on there? And then you got to hold it really tight and then straight on. Yeah. So <clears throat> my story is, um, you want me to come up? Okay. Denny has not only um, traveled the long roads to vaccinate in Ethiopia, but he is also has his own foundation called Just Two Drops. And Denny has raised lots of money for um, a rehab center outside of Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia. And he has raised thousands of dollars, hundreds of tens of thousands of dollars by working with his own foundation. And I'll let him tell you what he's done there because I don't want to, I want to steal the show. You give me a mic, it's really dangerous. I can just keep going and going. So we'll let Denny talk about what, what developed um, at this wonderful rehab center where they, they take children who've suffered from polio and uh, do therapy and exercise and group games and all, some of these kids are in wheelchairs, some are on crutches, et cetera. And they all feel like they're in a place where everybody gets them, right? That everybody understands that they have a, an issue and they're all in there together. So, Denny, first let's talk about what, what made you come to Ethiopia with Ezra the first time around. Well, when I uh, uh, got ready to uh, retire uh, from my career, I was made aware that there was a program to eradicate polio. And so I uh, started asking around, and and uh, a friend worked for um, Ralph Monroe, and uh, former Secretary of State, of former Washington. Secretary of State to the state of Washington, and um, and I happened to mention to her I'm trying to find out about that, and she said, "Well, my boss goes to uh, Ethiopia, and why don't you ask him?" So I uh, sent him an email, and uh, he sent back. Uh, two words, how to get involved in uh, the polio eradication was to uh, join Rotary. So uh, I um, I joined Rotary in June of 2005, and uh, my first trip to Ethiopia was in October of 2005. And I've been going back almost every year since, except for the COVID uh, years, and then I had a little difficulty the last couple of years. But uh, I think uh, about 13 or 14, 15 years I've gone back every year to uh, vaccinate. So as a polio survivor, what is that like for you to to give those precious two drops to a child? To... Uh... Hold a baby. And know that they'll never have polio by uh, putting those two drops in their mouth is uh, the best feeling in the world. I don't think anybody here can understand how personal that that is for you, Denny. And is certainly spurred you on to create your foundation and tell us what you've accomplished with the money that's been donated to, to just two drops well thank you for asking i um i went to uh ethiopia and uganda to uh vaccinate babies and uh when i was there i i saw many people uh crawling on the ground limited mobility of various kinds who had uh, missed out on the uh, the polio vaccine and um, uh, wanted to uh, help with uh, rehabilitation. So uh, I uh, asked uh, Cheshire uh, Services Ethiopia, which was a, a, a polio rehabilitation facility, outside of Addis Ababa, what, uh, what they could use. And, and uh, we talked about hydrotherapy, which is uh, physical exertion in, uh, in water, in a, like in a swimming pool. 
And so uh, I uh, uh, raised funds with uh, other organizations to uh, to build a hydrotherapy facility in uh, outside of Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, and it's uh, it took quite a while to get it uh, the funds raised. It was uh, 160000 dollars, and uh, I I formed a foundation for uh, contributions to be tax deductible, and then uh, reached out to a lot of other organizations to uh, participate in it and. Um, we dedicated it in 2017, and it's been in operation ever since. It's a very clean, very beautiful facility. Um, I encourage you to go and uh, and check it out. And the kids, Ezra, you've seen these kids in this hydrotherapy pool. Tell me a little bit about the difference that this this incredible gift from Denny and his donors have made, the difference it's made for these kids. The, the Cheshire Home is a rehab center for kids who had polio. And to go in into that whirlpool, it is a life-changing experience. Like Denny, when I went there, saw this kid, I was in tears. It just uh, the, the, the movement, uh, the, the ability for them to just be able to hold the the uh, pole and go around the water, just a life-changing experience. And uh, Danny, that was just uh, the wonderful gifts that you have given. And, uh, it is a state-of-the-art whirlpool that is currently still being used. Well, thank you very much. It, uh, I grew up without any physical therapy, but my mom would uh, tell me to uh, get out of the house and go to the lake and go swimming. And so uh, and I've studied about it. Um, hydrotherapy is a very uh, uh, effective uh, physical therapy rehabilitation process. Well, you've made a huge difference, Denny. You really have. I love you. Uh, I love you. <laughs> so, Ezra... Uh... You know, we talk about polio on this kind of global scale, this, you know, the hundreds of thousands of cases and the simplicity of giving the two drops and what it can mean. And the personal stories of people like Denny are what always resonate is it just becomes a very personal um, journey. And I know it has for you. You talked about meeting the little girl who is, who is too late for her. The relationships you developed there, the look of the moms, this is one thing I'll never forget, is the looks of the mothers holding their infants and looking at us as we drop these two drops in. It's, there's just nothing like it. Well, it is, it is a life-changing experience. I'm sure those of you who went with me, I know there are several here. Uh, it impacts you so much because, you know, the, the ability to save a child from being crippled or or lose lose uh, life is, you know, when we save those children, we're saving not only for them to walk healthy, but to be able economically be able to sustain themselves. Because the only thing they could do if they if they're crippled would be to go around the city, which you have seen so many of them, and beg, beg for a living. So. The impact that we made is is numerous. Uh, I can't think of so many of the mothers who would come and bring their child and just hand it to us. And to me, I think that always stays in my life. As I told the Rotarians in Ethiopia, I said, I will come here year after year until we wiped polio. And uh, we, we all, we're almost there. Like I said, we're this close. We're almost there, so I uh, appreciate everyone's support, uh, not only to come and and be able to save children, but to also donate money so the the money could help to purchase the vaccination. Going back to you, um, tonight, I want to know about the women. I know that you've been working very hard with women on the frontiers of polio. Will you tell us a little bit about how that's working, what, what you're doing. 
Absolutely. And, and thank you, Penny, for that question. I think working with women on the front lines is one of the things that brings me the most joy and, and meaning in my job. And, and really, this is an acknowledgement that when we have female vaccinators, it's only by empowering them and by listening to their voice that we will get close to eradication. Um, it's only when mothers speak to mothers that that sort of magic clicks and, and there's community acceptance and demand uh, for the vaccine. Um, I, I can speak about two initiatives uh, that are top of mind. In, in Pakistan, we've uh, recently started a groundbreaking initiative that aims to listen to women on the front lines or female vaccinators. Um, and here, both sort of the, the barriers that they're facing, as well as the solutions that they themselves propose. Some of these women are incredible. They're, they've been working in the program, going door to door, vaccinating children for 10, 15, sometimes 18 years. And they know their communities really well. And this is the first time uh, that their voices are being elevated um, from, from a small neighborhood, sometimes in the rural outskirts of our district, to a national and then a global level. So we're making sure that those solutions uh, are heard, that they're being implemented. And currently now the Pakistan program um, is creating a very tailored strategy to make sure that a lot of these issues that they've surfaced are addressed uh, effectively. And, and this has been a really uh, popular program. It's being adapted for different countries and like the DRC and Somalia and so on. So it's, it's, it's really quite powerful and rooted in uh, listening to women on the front lines and making sure that they have a voice. Um, the second project where I worked closely with women uh, comes from Afghanistan. And the context there is very tricky. You know, it's, a, it's a very conservative society. Uh, women's health is least prioritized. Um, women often don't have access to healthcare. And, and the part of my job where I work to strengthen health systems, we realize that often women don't have access to health facilities. They're either too far or they're closed at night or there's no female doctors working in those health facilities. And so a woman can't go and see uh, a male doctor or a nurse. And we just created a couple of tweaks in that design. We made sure that every health facility had a female midwife who was present at all times. Uh, and because of the culture and the religious beliefs uh, of those areas, we made sure that she had a male representative from her family at all times. And this could be someone who worked in security or admin at the same health facility. So that gives our, our midwife some protection as well. And this small change, this small tweak in design was just groundbreaking. It had a profound impact. It meant that more women felt confident coming to these health facilities they could come seek care when they were pregnant. They could come to these facilities to have their babies instead of having them at home. Um, and then as soon as those babies were born, they were vaccinated. Right? They were given um, our oral polio drops and they were given their routine immunization shot. Um, and, and I find that so inspiring. It's just by really being attentive, by listening to what women already know, what they're experiencing and addressing that in a very straightforward way. Sometimes it doesn't need to be complicated. Um, can really create profound impacts and changes in society. We have a lot to learn from the people who live in the places that we try to serve, right? And, and the other thing, uh, I know both of you could speak to this, as uh, um, Americans, at least, that have come into different countries to assist and help, they can do it without us. I mean, I mean not, not our money, probably, but it's not necessary for us as, uh, as Rotarians to come in and do it for them, they're already doing it. They are doing the work. They don't want polio in their country any more than than, than we do. And um, that's what's always so impressive is to see the incredible initiative of the people on the ground. And I think we come in rather as just sort of support to say, we're with you, we live halfway around the world, but we're with you and how can we assist? And and I think it kind of gives them a feeling of being supported and that it's we still have to finish the job. How is how have things changed since the Taliban took over for your work there? Uh, it's a good question, and again, I, I think a big question. Um, and while, I mean, I think we're very lucky that we work in a partnership 
So the GPI is no one partner, it's, it's several organizations working together. Uh, so even though the foundation is apolitical and we can't engage with the Taliban directly, we do work with them because we work with our partners. We work with UNICEF and WHO and other UN agencies who are good interlocutors for us. Um, and the main message is that we want to vaccinate children uh, and vaccinating children in some ways in conflict settings is not new. And it's what we needed to do in places like Nigeria, for example, to eradicate with the Boko Haram. Um, it's what we needed to do to eradicate in Somalia. And so the the race to vaccinate more children is, is sort of textbook. We know these are conflict-ridden areas. We've done it before in other countries. Um, and working with the Taliban, it's it's been surprising, but in many areas, we now have more access because there's not war. <laughs> So now there's not all out conflict, but of course, these are populations that have not received health care in many, many years. So there are under immunized um, and, and there's many more challenges there to unpack. Uh, but overall, we found we've had more access to children living in hard to reach areas and far flung areas. We found these communities are very resilient and we found that the expertise in the GPI is actually exists and it knows how to work in conflict areas like Afghanistan. Really interesting. Um, Ezra, you know, your country has been involved in a civil war, um, sadly, over the last few years. How has that, has that had any deleterious effect on the immunization program? Well, we haven't been back since 2019. Uh, in the past, we could go anywhere without any problem, but now with the internal fighting, the tribal friction, it makes it harder for us to go to those countries, uh, to those areas. But at the same time, I also like to recognize my team that have helped uh, to really organize. And also, once you go there, you see so many things and you say, I could bring water to this village. I could do, I could buy a desk for this school. You know, you, you recognize the issues and you find a solution for it. And I want to recognize a few people uh, by by name, Dave uh, Weaver, Dave Spicer, Maureen Brotherton, Ben Abe, and Ray Connell. They really have done a tremendous work to support the work that I do and also to come back and say, well, let's let's get water to this area. So it goes beyond the vaccination. You see the the problems, you come up with a solution for it. Yes, so, so true, Ezra. Yeah. And the infrastructure that Rotary has in countries all over the world, it's amazing how things can get done and the matching grants from international, et cetera. Why don't the people that Ezra mentioned that are here with us uh, stand to be recognized for the work that you've done with water, women's health? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Do do you. Amazing. Well, um, we're going to open it up now to some question and answers from all of you out here. So feel free to ask anything of our panelists, um, maybe a question for Denny or, 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 or whatever. So. Who has the first question? Okay, do you want me to get, use the mic? Okay. I'll give it to you. Hi, thanks everybody. Uh, this question may be a few years out of date, but I've heard of some polio outbreaks like in New York City and whatnot. Um, how is that going? Thank you for that question. I think it's a it's an important and urgent question, um, and it's it it really underscores how important it is to eradicate polio everywhere, um, because the U.S. hasn't seen polio in, in decades, right? Um, and and it and the case of the detection in in the U.S. and in the U.K. and Canada in the same years all happened in communities that were under immunized. Uh, someone from that community traveled somewhere where there was polio and they brought it back home. But luckily there's not been a case of paralysis because everyone around them is, is immunized. And, and my key takeaway from that is even though, it, I mean, my key takeaway is it's so important for all of us to remain up to date with our vaccinations. Uh, and the second key insight there is 
no, unless we eradicate everywhere, polio is just going to be a plane ride, a trip, a field visit away. Um, the virus is very resilient. Uh, it's shown up in places where typically we wouldn't expect to find it. Um, but that's also why we need to keep going and make sure there's no more wild polio virus anywhere in the world. Um, and, and really underscores how we, we cannot get complacent about eradicating at this point <laughs> in the endeavor. Absolutely. That's a great question. Thank you. Uh, I just might remind you of a story that uh, when Ezra and I started working together, uh, the next year after we started in 2003 or 2004, I think, believe it was, um, Ethiopia was ready to be certified polio free. And you have to have no new cases for three years to get that certification from the World Health Organization. And um, during that time, Nigeria, the northern part of Nigeria in the Kano district, decided to suspend their polio program. And what happened, it was uh, over fear of what the vaccine was going to do to people. But, uh, and they mis mistakenly believed that it was a plot to sterilize men and women in that part of the world. So um, they stopped the vaccinations and it came out of Nigeria, northern Nigeria, and spread. I want to make sure I have my numbers correct here. I wrote it down. Massive outbreaks all over the world. And it went to 20 previously free, polio-free nations in a matter of months. 20 countries were reinfected that had been declared polio-free just from one area of the world deciding to stop their program. So I know that Bill Gates himself, right, Ezra, went to, to Nigeria and um, talked with tribal chiefs and explained to them how the vaccine works and, and uh, you know, met face-to-face, -face, honored their fears and uh, made it a very personal um, appeal. And they got back on track. And uh, that was really scary, though. So came into Ethiopia and all the way across to, uh, I believe, Saudi Arabia even. OK, another question out here? Yeah. yeah. Uh, hi, you guys do great work. Ezra, that picture looked really young. Uh, that was up there, by the way. Uh, 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 I missed it. <laughs> hey, so you preempted my question because that's what I was going to ask. How you, when I was younger, I remember everybody was afraid or when I was in another country, they thought the CIA were involved in vaccinations. I was a Peace Corps person and that's what people were saying. So how did you overcome that uh, in populations where you didn't really have any trust? That's, that, I guess that's my question. Thanks. Yeah, the trust is really to continue to talk to the religious leaders the local Rotarians, this is where they come in. You know, they know who is who is in charge. They could go personally to communicate and say, "Hey, look, and if you don't trust the vaccinators, why don't we bring the vaccination to your mosque so you can have your own people give the vaccination?" So there's a lot of dialogue between the local Rotarians and the the religious leaders and other leaders who are opposing the vaccination. So Rotarians have done a tremendous work to really go out and reach out to those kind of people. I'm just curious. The question was, did uh, Rotarians work with Peace Corps? Uh, about five or six years ago, they signed, Rotary signed an agreement to work with Peace Corps. Before that, uh, no. But right now, there are so many areas that Peace Corps covers that we also, Rotarians cover as well. So now we're, we're working with Peace Corps. Another question right here, right down here in front. Go, Deborah. Yeah, so um, I just want to share and then share an experience and then ask a question. So um, back home in my country, um, just like I was having flashbacks after um, Ezra was sharing his story of how they track kids who are vaccinated. So I am from Ghana and um, what they do is a lot of people, they carpool in a van. So you have like 35 people in a van. So what they do is they stop, they have um, law enforcement officers who stop the cars in the middle of the road, everybody gets down, and then they have the vaccinators, those who give out the vaccines, they vaccinate every child in the car, 
and then they mark them with permanent ink on their uh, pinky. Yeah, pinky and then they allow them to go so they do that for every car so whilst you were sharing your story that came to mind and i just wanted to share it but um i have a question my question is um when it comes to polio another important aspect of it is to also ensure that there's a break in the chain of transmission and this is related to issues of water sanitation and hygiene so i want to know apart from giving the polio vaccines what other projects are you like engaging in to educate people about the transmission do you have any other projects apart from giving um the vaccines out to um folks who are like in very vulnerable to this virus just want to know we should probably just say how the virus is transmitted first of all maybe just a quick uh and then ezra you can go on yeah just how is about let's explain to people how it's transmitted um fecal matter fecal matter yeah <laughs> and usually through waterways right like yes. an unclean sanitation yeah. system or, or which is much of the world unfortunately yes. okay ezra so go ahead the involvement comes in like i said when we go into the the villages in fact uh, a story i like to tell is with the hawaiian rotarians we walked for like two hours to go from village to village and they haven't seen any water so they asked me, is there water in this village? I said, I don't know, let me ask the elders. So when I asked the elders, they said, well, we walk about an hour every day to get water, to bring to our family. In the afternoon, they take the animals to drink water. So the Hawaiian Rotarians huddled and said, how much would it take to bring water to this village? And I said, maybe, 30,000 or 40,000, I don't know. And then he said, well, he said, bring the elder. When he come in, he said, look, we live in, in an island surrounded by water. We've got so much and we want to bring water to your village. So that kind of involvement from the Rotarians happen all the time when we go to do the vaccination. You learn about the issues. And we've done quite a lot of water projects in Ethiopia, Uganda, and Kenya. And uh, you're right, without clean water, really the, there's other waterborne illnesses and other disease that could come in, but we're working to address those issues. Could I also just add a, a couple of points there? I think um, there's a few layers to your question. I think it's a really good question. Um, I think the first is, you know, this this fight to eradicate polio isn't just about polio. It's also about strengthening health systems as a whole. It's about creating more resilient communities who are able to sort of use the skilled workforce, use the infrastructure and the resources um, to really combat other diseases uh, and other public health uh, emergencies as well. Uh, a lot of the polio infrastructure was used uh, to help curb the spread of COVID-19. Uh, back in 2020. Uh, and I think from a more recent experience, uh, when I had the opportunity to monitor a campaign in Karachi in Pakistan, um, I saw something really incredible, uh, which was, you know, one of the strategies we're using um, to, to counter refusals and uh, encourage people to take the vaccine is to employ vaccinators who are from the same communities. Um, so to the gentleman's question earlier, uh, once the vaccinators from your own community and they speak your language, you, you tend to trust them more and uh, you therefore trust the vaccine more. Mm -hmm. Higher chances that you would take the vaccine and be protect, protected from polio. But what I saw in Karachi was just so much more than this, because for the first time in maybe decades, you had refugees living on the outskirts of a city who were enthusiastically asking for the vaccine, which doesn't happen, <laughs> right? Um, and they were asking for this vaccine because uh, the vaccinators were from the same communities. And over time, they became so much more than vaccinators. They were now catalysts of change. Uh, so when they were not working in a campaign, they were helping enroll children in schools and they were helping parents access health care, taking them to health facilities, um, you know, helping them get ID cards and so on. And I found that that was so inspirational. I think just by setting up the backbone of a program, one good functioning program in Pakistan, uh, it enabled these communities to do so much more. And that was profoundly inspiring to see. And, and I think that's, that's a legacy that 
polio eradication would be proud to have. Yeah, it's not polio vaccines in a vacuum, right? It's a lot more. Maureen, I want you to talk about what you've done in northern uh, Uganda. Uh, Maureen Brotherton is here. She traveled with Ezra in, uh, in what year, Maureen? 2005. So we could get a, a microphone to Maureen. Yeah. Um, I wasn't so tell prepared. us uh, how how your trip to e with Ezra grew into what you're doing now. And a lot of it has to do with young women and water and, and, and health uh, support for women. Well, it's it's interesting because following your comments, I was my mind is back in Ethiopia right now going through all the years of traveling with Ezra and the team. Um, and I was impressed with the village healthcare workers. They're the ones that are educating the parents when you're at their house or their hut saying there's standing water there. You know, you don't want mosquitoes because of malaria or that child looks ill. So they were really doing much more than just the the drops. And from my trips with Ezra, I've always wanted to go to Uganda with Ben Abe, who's here. And uh, I weaseled my way into a trip there, uh, which has led me to become involved in many ways in the villages there. And a lot of it is with women in, in villages um, and a healthcare hospital that came all from Rotary Connections, a lot of it, and a, a professional bee, honeybee person who with Rotary starting his first bee farm uh, became an exporter of honey and changed his you know, village by training other bee farmers. Um, but the, the, the things that can happen with just making a trip and taking the time to connect on the internet, that was a lot of it. Because once you're gone, you don't want to forget the people. In fact, in Uganda, it was women in a village that sang a song to me when I was leaving. And I think Denny was with me on that trip. And it was Do Not Forget Us. And I've not forgotten them. And we've been back several times and those women still remember. And hopefully, you know, some good has come from the different networking. But networking, global networking is just tremendous opportunity, especially for the Northwest, you know, with University of Washington. And I was at Seattle University today. And they're interested in global connections for health, too. So we're lucky here in the Northwest. Thank you. Thanks for telling us about that. Yeah. And Dave Spicer back there. Dave's been very involved in water projects have, all over the world. I have an observation and also a question. Speak Those straight into it, Dave, so we can hear you straight in. I, I have an observation and a question for the panel. The observation is most of us who've gone to Ethiopia with Ezra, we've been surprised about Ezra's uh, Ethiopian dancing skills. And we just want to... if. If you plan to take some more classes, maybe. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Ezra. No, this more serious question is, let's say we. I look at uh, 1987, 350,000 cases a year, 125 countries, like you said, Penny. You know, I think of it as a football field, like 100 yards you've gone down. We're in the final one inch or five inch line, two countries. If we're successful, which I know we will be, hopefully in a few years or 10 years, and we've eradicated polio from the planet. Do we have to continue to globally continue with the potential for outbreak of polio, even though we've eradicated? Or maybe if you can just give your insight about what that might involve. Thank you. And thank you, panel. Who wants to take that? I, I, I can start. Thank you, Dave. So let's repeat the question that, uh, in case maybe you didn't hear it, uh, people listening at home. Um, the question was, once we eradicate polio and there's no more transmission, do we have the danger of it still reappearing sort of uh, precariously in places where we hadn't expected, sort of like when it showed up in New York? Or, mm -hmm. Well, I love that question because it's so hopeful. Uh, I, I absolutely hope, I mean, I'm very confident that we will eradicate in the next few years. Um, and, and already the GPI has started to think about what does the next phase look like? Um, and I think top of mind are two things that this next phase might involve. One is just to maintain, you know, enough support so that if the virus ever shows up, you know, the countries know who to call, how to respond, how to how to sort of mount an effective campaign so that it really is stopped in its tracks. 
you know, a situation like we were talking about earlier where suddenly it spreads to 20 countries doesn't happen. So I think we'll need to maintain some minimal level of infrastructure there. But the second phase of, of sort of this um, strategy or, or thought process into the future would, would sort of involve you know, making the best use of all of these really strong, resilient resources in country. Uh, in countries where we've eradicated, there is now a highly skilled workforce, very well versed in uh, community mobilization, in healthcare, and providing uh, access to healthcare. We have a lot of infrastructure for polio. We have, uh, you know, so many fantastic resources. I think at the end of this eradication initiative, we will also have faith in humanity that we can do something that big. Uh, and then it's really up to the country. You know, what, what's the next ambition? What do you want to do? Um, we know that we can achieve big things if we have the commitment, we have the resources. And at that point, well, what does the country do? Do they want to you know, maintain their health system? Do they want to strengthen uh, or mount, uh, you know, a, a different eradication program? Who knows? <laughs> but I would be very hopeful for the for the next phase of uh, sort of eradication and polio. Uh, once it's done from these two countries. And thank you for that question. So thank you. Guys. That was our kind of wrap up here is, do you have hope that we can eradicate this disease? Can we can we put polio in the place where we put smallpox as the second disease that humankind has eradicated? Ezra? Well, what it takes is money. And Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have agreed to match every dollar that we give twice. So if you give a dollar, they'll give two. So please continue to give because uh, we have to raise $50 million to get that match. And I appreciate all the giving that you have done as Rotarians and please continue to do so. And hopefully we might do a trip again next year to go and personally, if you want to personally participate in the vaccination. And uh, I'd like to recognize our current governor, Kai Peterson here. And, and, and past governor Howard Cohen and future governor Ray Connell, welcome. Thank you. And that wraps up our program this evening. Um, we want to thank all the people who have made this possible here at the Gates Foundation, all of you for attending tonight, all of you listening, wherever you might be in the world, whether it's your evening, hours, morning, or afternoon. Um, and we also want to say thank you to all the people doing the hard work on the ground in some of these remote villages all over the world. We appreciate you. We recognize you. We honor you. Now, if you'd like more information to hear about Discovery Center, where we are, you can just go onto Instagram and Facebook and at Discover Gates. You can get updates on upcoming events virtually, and you can follow Rotary by going to Rotary at Rotary International at Rotary International. So thank you all once again. And uh, as we leave, we're going to have a short survey here on the screen. We'd love for you to participate that as we wrap up World Polio Day 2023. Thank you, everyone. Let's get this job done. And polio now. Good job.